28 seconds. 27. 26. 25 seconds. 24. 23. 22 seconds. 21 seconds. 22 seconds. 19. 18. 17 seconds. 16. 15 seconds. 14. 13 seconds. 12. 11. 10 seconds. 9. 8. 7. 6. It's white. Copy. 5 seconds. Oh. 3. 2. 1. Welcome to Subspace Chatter where we boldly go into discussions of various topics in Star Trek today. Today is a special episode as we bring you actor and artist Bruce Horak, who played Chief Engineer Hemmer on the first season of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. As usual, we have a panel of co-hosts joining us on today's discussion. I'm your host, Bob Vossler longtime fan and 40-year member of Starfleet, the International uh, Star Trek Fan Association. And uh, we'll, we'll introduce everyone. Uh, let's, let's start off. Dan, maybe you might want to yeah. introduce yourself. I'm, I'm Dan, I'm a uh, uh, former longtime admin of Memory Alpha and chief editor of um, the website warpfactortrack.com. Um, I am Scott. I am the host of the YouTube channel Opinions No One Cares About. And I'm Vanessa and host a YouTube channel called I Love Bad Star Trek. All right. Bruce, what are your earliest memories of, of Star Trek? My earliest memories? Uh, watching the original series with the family gathered around the television set and reruns and some, some point in the... Uh, in the 80s, I think we were fans of that. Yeah, yeah, the original series for sure. So it was um, clearly a thrill when you were cast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to put it mildly, it was a thrill. I mean, uh, I, I followed the, the franchise all the way through the, the, uh, the movies and Next Generation. And I mean, I think when Wrath of Khan came out, I was at that that perfectly formative age where I was just blown away by the story and where they took the characters and uh, yeah, they could kind of do no wrong for a while there. Um, and yeah, all the way through to, uh, to getting cast, it was just, uh, I, I was a fan and, and followed along with it. And yeah, the opportunity to even put my name in the hat for a role in the series, just that was thrilling enough. And then to actually get to go and step onto the bridge of the enterprise, it was just like, Mind-boggling. <laughs> um, I wrote down, um, like, the, your portrayal of Hammer, like, really struck a chord with me. And thank you so much for playing the character so amazingly, bringing representation of disability to the forefront in Strange New Worlds. Um, how do you feel about depictions of blindness in Star Trek generally? Uh, generally, it gives me a lot of hope. Um, when the character of Geordi LaForge was presented, um, it really got me thinking about where technology was going to advance and how that was actually going to serve the disability community. Um, you know, since the advent of the, the prosthetic leg and pirate days or whatever, I mean, we've, we've been finding ways to adapt ourselves physically uh, to fit into a, a, the able world, as it were. And, uh, you know, within my lifetime, the, the advent of the iPhone and GPS systems and voiceover technology, all of that within such a short period of time, it's, I mean, we're seeing it now, that, that vision of the future where, you know, anyone can fit in, anyone can, can have an opportunity. And I find that, I find that to be really thrilling. Okay, um, so uh, what about the role attracted you to it? Um, are there aspects about the NR that you connect with? Yes, uh, I love the I love the uh, the sense of uh, skill that that Hammer had. He's obviously incredibly gifted at what he does. Uh, that was very appealing to play a character that um, you know had that level of confidence and competence was was very attractive. Um, 
looking back at, at the, the history of the ENR, which, which don't have much of, but we know from enterprise that they're a dwindling species, that there's not many of them left, that they're very reclusive, um, and that they have this incredible telepathy. I thought, wow, what a great challenge to play all of that. Um, uh, beyond that, you know, just getting to play on Star Trek. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, I dig it. I'm in. You betcha. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm uh, so excited to meet you. <laughs> um, so what was the process like to become Hemmer with the makeup and costuming? Oh, it was, uh, it was long and, uh, yeah, it was detailed. I won't get too graphic about it, but they had to do a full, uh, head cast mold. And then, uh, they took my arms as well. Uh, hands all the way up to gloves, kind of putting it in this blue goo that would then get plastered over and, and they use that as the, the base mold. Um, I had no idea what the character was going to look like until I had my first day of prosthetics testing where uh, I think actually they, they pretty much had all hands on deck for that first day to, to get it done. It took five and a half hours in the makeup chair on the very first day where they applied all of the pieces. And there's, I think, almost 15 pieces, including bits on the hands, um, you know, starting with the, the wig cap and the antenna and then cheeks and chin and nose and all ears and just so much stuff. Uh, and then it was all painted as well. So they had to get the color right and they wanted to get the shadows right. And then we put it in front of the camera. So that was on that very first day where I sat in the chair. That was the first time I, I got to leave the prosthetics trailer and go to set and stand on the bridge in front of six cameras. And uh, yeah, what a thrill. I mean, I, I, I would be lying if I didn't say it was emotional because, um, you know, I dreamed of someday doing that and uh, getting to walk on there. And, you know, and then it was another hour, I think maybe on the first day, about an hour and a half to get out of all the prosthetics. So any day that I shot, uh, they got it down to about three and a half hours, uh, the, the full getting into. Um, yeah, and you know, the day where I got to do the costume fitting was also really thrilling. I mean, it was a very basic red, the red shirt and the, the pants and and the boots and, uh, and, and the, even though it was all covered with pins and there was you know, nothing really finished yet, you could immediately imagine what this uh, character was going to look like. And just getting the chance to develop that on screen was yeah, a little thrill. And I got to disappear for a while. And they told me, um, actually, just after I had the head mold done, they wanted to do a contact lens test because most of the characters uh, would be wearing these kind of whited out contacts. Um, and because my right eye is artificial, they were actually going to, they were in talks to build me a new one which is a whole process in itself. And then they were going to put a lens in my left eye. And I, I went to a specialist in Toronto to have the lens fitted. And because I would be in makeup uh, for the whole day, in order to have the lens put in and taken out, you'd have to have somebody else do it. And that process was just too much for me. Put the lens in and it was, I mean, already my, my vision is pretty impaired. So as the doctor said, you got nine percent vision as you're you're working with right now. Let's let's let you let's let's keep it at least that. And the production team said no problem. They just rolled with it and said we'll fix it in post. So when you see Hammer's eyes on screen, they've gone back and they've actually digitally altered that, which is, hmm. I mean, that's a whole other uh, that's a whole other part of you know going back to the depiction of blindness on Star Trek is that they're able to digitally alter someone so that they have that appearance, I think is, is pretty exciting. And again, I think it opens the door for possibilities down the road of what can we do with the digital effects now? Um, not just altering, um, you know, physical appearance, but also abilities and capabilities. And uh, I mean, we see that in, in lower decks where it's all animated, but what we can actually do with the live actor now, is, it's, it's extraordinary, truly. Bruce, while the Andorians have been part of Star Trek since the, the very beginning, the original series, uh, we only got to see the Anar prior to Strange New Worlds on one episode or so of, of Star Trek Enterprise. How influential was that particular episode for your, your portrayal? Or, you know, did you draw a lot from that? Or was it pretty wide open? 
uh, I definitely went back and watched it um, just to get a sense of uh, how the actors were moving. Um, were they were they kind of stumbling around or whatever? And honestly, after watching the episode, I felt like okay, there's there's a real wide there's a real wide net that we can cast with this character. And I really just dug into what was given in the script and uh, you know the the conversation with the showrunner about what Hammer was going to be like and what his role over the first season was going to be in terms of um, his relationship with with Uhura and being a bit of a curmudgeonly mentor figure who softens over time as their relationship develops. So I thought in order to give the character a bit of that arc that he needs if he's gonna if he's gonna be soft then we gotta start him as far away from that as possible so the the first uh, introductions of the character i played to play, tried to play him as icy cold as possible take the uh, the inspiration from the, the design of of the planet that we see from enterprise of that cold sort of mm, uh it's almost uh it's almost uh, what would you call it? institutional the way that the uh, all the hallways look on that uh, on that Eno world. Mm. So place him there and just let that stuff speak. <laughs> <laughs> so were you involved in uh, the makeup and costuming for the role? And if so, did you know um, whether the antenna were ever intended to move a bit like Stan's do in Star Trek Enterprise? Uh, I had absolutely no say in what he was going to look like or uh, or any of the costuming. That was definitely a discussion uh, throughout the shooting was what they were going to do, if they were going to get the antenna to move. I think they only moved in maybe one scene, but there were a couple of shots where um, they did some reaction shots of just the antenna and said, well, we might, we might cut this in and have them do a little twitch or something, but... Uh, Obviously, um, that was decided against. I mean, I would, I would love to see, uh, to see them be really active, but I understand that when, uh, uh, what was his name, who played Shran, Je uh, Jeffrey Coombs, um, that they had, they actually had in his head, they had like little motors or something, mm. that were quite loud. <laughs> so personally, I'm, I'm also glad that I, I didn't have a, a worrying whiz gig on my head for uh, 18 hours a day. <laughs> Um, so there were some fans that noticed that the tips of Hammer's antennae were blackened. Is there a reason for that? <laughs> uh, I like to think that it's because his telepathy is so strong that they, they get a little burnt out. It's like when you're playing guitar and you get big calluses on your fingers. Like that's how good his telepathy is. And you can tell how strong an Enar's telepathy is by, the, by how black the tips of the antenna are. A young one, they'd be pretty pink. So as you get older, they, they get blacker. That's that's completely out of canon. <laughs> uh, there were a few episodes where Hemmer didn't appear. Is there like a was there like a reason maybe um, like scheduling or no? Um... He was not intended to be uh, to really be that featured. I think um, just in the five episodes. I, other than that, it was I was certainly open. <laughs> I think I think people just really miss the character and and really enjoy it so much that its absence was very noticeable. So I uh, appreciate that. Yeah, yeah even wanting yeah. more. I guess that's the uh, the lesson from my experience with Star Trek. <laughs> and yeah, I didn't. I was gonna throw this in like there were a couple of times like you know these guys know because i've complained about it before a couple of episodes where we were reviewing it and i was just saying where's hammer because there were some points where i was like you know this problem has a pretty uh or could have a pretty clear engineering solution mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i agree with that why don't we get in a little bit into your artist uh you know your work as an artist uh did that come early on in your life your interest there or you know yeah like that. i came i come from a, a very artistic family um my father was a cartoonist and a painter and a english teacher and a drama teacher mom is a writer and uh since my father passed away is, has become a real renaissance woman she's gotten back into music and singing and playing piano and i have three older brothers who are all involved in the arts so 
growing up, it was just everywhere. And we were encouraged to explore as much or as little as we wanted to. So, um, yeah, I started, you know, doodling in my, uh, in my school scribblers from the time I was a kid and uh, was a terrible student because I spent most of my time drawing cartoons of my teachers and <laughs> trying to make my friends laugh. I uh, was a bit of a class clown as well, but got into music and theater very early on. Um, and as I got through high school, I, I started to narrow and had to narrow the options. So I, I dropped art when I was in grade 11, but got back into it in uh, 2000 and, uh, 2011. A friend of mine saw me on stage and asked how it is that I'm able to do what I do with 9% vision. So I sat down and I painted his portrait in an attempt to capture the way that I see. And that uh, portrait sitting turned into basically another career. Um, I have sat now with over 600 people and painted their portraits. And uh, behind me, you can see a number of them. And they are, uh, individually, they are a, a daily practice. But as a whole, it is, uh, I think, yeah, overall, I'd say that, you know, combined, it, it, it captures uh, a, a sense or an essence of how I see. And that uh, drive to, to express that has led me into um, a whole career in, in talking about disability arts and working with people who are disabled to express themselves and perhaps get over some of the creative blocks that they might be experiencing. Hmm. You know, I, I uh, by profession, I'm, I'm a reporter. And uh, earlier this week, I interviewed a uh, visually impaired uh, musician who I'll be, see be seeing in uh, just a few hours. And she's uh, not only a wonderful musician, but she is an advocate uh, for those with, with visual impairments and trying to get special accommodations for certain things like the college boards and things like that. So. Uh, she was thrilled to hear, you know, she was so happy to see representation and uh, it, particularly of your character uh, in Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Do you feel that perhaps, you know, those with special challenges are a bit under underrepresented in the media, you know, within movies? Uh, or? Yeah, you know, it's it's certainly shifting. I think we're seeing a lot more of it these days, which is great. I think... Mm -hmm. um, considerations around it are certainly much uh, much higher than they used to be. Um, when I first got into auditioning for film and television, very, very rare to see a call for a, a, you know, a visually impaired actor to play a visually impaired character. So mm -hmm. when, um, and really in the last few years of seeing much more of that, a, an attempt to, to get different bodies and different types on, on screen that, um, you know, or stepping into those roles, it's um, it's certainly changing. I think we're we're moving deeper into that story. I think eventually that it will get to a point where actors will just act. But I think right now where the conversation is at, it's that's very important to, to be seeing um, mm -hmm. kind of that shift. And and it's certainly marking the time that we're in right now because it seems to be the forefront of the conversation. Definitely. Yeah. What are some of your future plans, uh, Bruce? Uh, you know, within either your artwork or your acting, or you know, I'm continuing to work on the portrait project. So I have, uh, I do it over Zoom now. So I've been sitting with people all over the world, which is so cool. Um, I sit and do a 45 minute Zoom chat, and then uh, from that, I do a digital uh, interpretation of the face that I've seen. And then from that, I'll, I'll go back and I'll edit out some of the audio and put it together as a time-lapse video that then supplements um, the uh, the canvas painting that I do. So the, the practice continues to expand and evolve. Um, I'm off to my hometown of Calgary, Alberta at the end of September to remount a show that I did back in March called Goblin Macbeth. Oh. Uh, my creative partner, Rebecca Northam, and uh, we have a musician named Ellis Lamond. Um, it was a show that really just kind of erupted a brainchild of Rebecca where 
three goblins discover the complete works of William Shakespeare and decide to try theater for the first time. We bought uh, we bought three <laughs> silicon masks from a company in the states called uh, Composite Effects, and they're full head, neck, shoulder uh, silicon goblin faces, and they're oh, just wow. extraordinary. Um, so yeah, we did a, about a seventy-five or eighty-minute version of uh, of Macbeth, where Rebecca and I play the characters and then switch off the roles and kind of jump around. Ella, um, I don't know who, who who else does that sort of stuff, but uh, it's got a real light kind of improv vibe to it as well. Lots of audience participation, and uh, so yeah, we're going back uh, September, October to do a three-week run of that, which is pretty exciting. And then uh, I have a solo show. Uh, one person show where I paint a portrait of the entire audience while I tell the story mm -hmm. of becoming one of Canada's only visually impaired visual artists. And I solve the mystery of who killed Tom Thompson, who was an influential Canadian artist who died mysteriously in 1917. And his mm -hmm. ghost apparently haunts uh, this park in Northern Ontario, which is a show I've been doing for about 10 years now. And in uh, February and March of 2023, I'll be touring the beautiful province of Manitoba, which uh, promises mm. to be uh, cool. <laughs> the show is called Assassinating Thompson. And uh, yeah, it's absolutely my joy to, to do that show. I, I, as I said, I paint a portrait of the audience. And then following the show, we auction the portrait off and donate the proceeds to a local charity. And uh, I was just in Ottawa at the National Arts Centre doing a week-long run of Assassinating Thompson, and we raised almost $3,000 for a local charity group that trains guide dogs for the blind. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's my favorite thing to do. But I say that of everything I'm doing. Whatever I'm working on now is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Gang, do we have some more questions here? Um, yeah, I didn't want to jump a line, but... Um... So, uh, your second to last episode, the Elysian Kingdom, features some very deliberate overacting by Hemmer. How much of a performance <laughs> challenge was that for you? Oh, that's more in my wheelhouse than the restrained stuff, uh, <laughs> for sure. No, it was nice. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. I felt like I kind of got uh, not taken off the leash, but I just got to kind of slip in and, and play around a bit more. Um, my background is in improvisation comedy and uh clowning as well so for me just to let hammer off a leash a bit that way was a lot of fun and it felt like okay if he's if we've, we've seen him soften with uhura then then he's gonna he's gonna play into this world and uh, yeah that was a riot it was also really really fun to make babs laugh <laughs> i felt like i was getting i was getting serious actor points every time i got a snicker out of babs <laughs> Is there a, a director you've enjoyed working with the most on Strange New Worlds? They have all been great. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt, but the one that leaps to mind for me was Chris Byrne, who directed the, the, my final episode. Um, I'm a big fan of horror film, um, just going way back. And I also, yeah, just playing in that world. He set, he set the, the, the off-screen environment to a point where you just felt like you were shooting like an awesome horror film you know we were sitting in sick bay waiting to while you know waiting for the, the camera to get set up as we were breaking into the back side of the peregrine and while we're sitting in sick bay the lights are flickering and it's all dim back there and you hear like kind of the creaking of the ship and and it was they kept it really cold which was great and uh yeah i just loved all of that and, and he would chris would be standing beside the camera you know he just kn knows the that world so well i mean i, I never heard a director just be so specific with like this type of lens and this type of thing and this is how much Dutch we need and like it's just awesome to watch him working in that world obviously he's very skilled at that but also yeah he just kept the energy up and those really long days that uh it was all the way through just felt like um yeah it's just he set that tone and it was just a lot of fun to try to get up there and match it cool um so we've had the comment basically um, saying uh, the person is saying to love Hammer um, and wish that, that he could be there for season two. Um, and losing Hammer was a, clearly a blow to so many fans. Uh, we just started to love yeah. the character and also we lost an important character for representation of people with disabilities in command roles. 
with Tamar gone, what do you think Track can do for representation in the future? Well, I think they can continue to to put the casting net out for actors with, with different abilities. And I, I see no reason why they can't be doing that. I, I honestly don't know uh, what they have in store for other characters that are coming on now. I mean, the thing about Strange New Worlds is we kind of know where it's going. We know that eventually Scotty's showing up and we know that, you know, Kirk's going to eventually be showing up. So, you know, certain roles that we just know are going to be filled, but the journey to, from Hammer to Scotty is at this point, I don't know, maybe it's been written, but I, I feel like it's wide open. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to see what where they're going to go next. Um, you know, for myself, uh, you know, I can say that that uh, my career with Star Trek is not over. So hopefully, um, you know, my continued appearance in the series will will uh, give some give some representation um, out there as well. Try not to give any spoil. <laughs> Trying. It's been so great. It's been so great to speak with you today. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists who, who joined us today. And also a special thank you, Bruce, for, for being part of today's program. Um, we hope our viewers have uh, will in, have enjoyed today's interview and uh, will Remember to uh, like and subscribe to this video, and we'll see you next time on Subspace Chatter. Trek you later. <laughs>